have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 1. The message is entitled, Finding Balance in Your Faith Walk. We have to have balance in every area of our life. Everything has to have balance. In John chapter 1, let's pick it up in verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When He came, Jesus was full of grace and truth. And John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness we have all received grace for grace for the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ no one has seen God at any time the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he has declared him God created man to have two legs I know that's deep but just hang in there with me he gave us two so that we can maintain our balance To further help us keep our balance, the Lord has also given us an equilibrium. Equilibrium means a state in which opposing forces or influences are balanced. God keeps balance in the earth. Or opposing forces would destroy life on this earth. Equilibrium also means a state of physical balance. Out of that comes a calm state of mind. If you've ever had your equilibrium get off kilter, it takes your confidence. You're not sure about your footing, are you? You think you're stepping, and when you step, it's like you just go off balance because you need that equilibrium. If you want to have and live in peace with God, you will need to learn how to live in a state of spiritual balance if someone says something to you and it causes you to lose your peace you need to go to God and ask him why their words took away your peace and then let him show you don't let anything or anyone take your peace if something happens in your life that causes you to lose your peace you need to go to God and ask him why you allowed yourself to let your peace be robbed from you through that event As we learn to walk in balance, we will also walk in peace with God. God introduced the law through Moses, the prophet. Say prophet. But God introduced both grace and truth through Jesus Christ, his son. Say son. It's interesting that the Lord chose the Old Testament to be based upon the prophets prophesying, but the New Testament is based upon his son. The law of God was given to his people through a man that occupied and operated from a spiritual office. Moses being one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. He operated in the office of the prophet. Yet, the grace and truth of God have been given to the New Testament church through his son, which speaks of relationship. One was of the law, works. But the other is of grace and truth, relationship, through his son. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13, please. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. For though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, And though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So if we speak in tongues, we become as sounding brass and clanging cymbals when we do it without love. And when we have faith and all knowledge and prophesy, but we don't have love, then we're nothing. And then if we bestow our goods on the poor to feed them and give our bodies to be burned, and yet we do it without love, it profits me nothing. So in other words, our works apart from love is nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, does not 
parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And people talk about when that perfect has come that Paul is talking about in this chapter, they talk about that as being heaven. Nowhere in this chapter does Paul mention heaven. That's tradition. The whole point of this chapter is love. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, love, then that which is done in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So that means when we start operating in love, and love is our motivation, we'll put away childish things and ways, won't we? For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. And now by faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. It has been the human nature in the body of Christ that has caused ministers to take a new revelation. God gives new revelation to the body of Christ constantly. But it has been the human nature of the body of Christ and of ministers to take a new revelation from God that has been shown to them and then use that one revelation as if it was the cure-all from God. People have done it. When the gifts of the Spirit and the apostolic age came in our generation, it was the cure-all. You've got to become spirit-filled so you can operate in the gifts and you've got to operate in the five-fold ministers. You've got to be apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. If you're not, then you're nothing. And they excluded so much by highlighting that one revelation. When the body of Christ misuses or overemphasizes a particular revelation, it will cause them to get off balance in their faith walk. This is why there are many offices and various giftings and spiritual functions within the body of Christ. Can I get a witness? We all have a purpose. We all have a function. We all have a gifting. In the middle of 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, the Lord had Paul write an entire chapter on love. He wanted to put an emphasis on love in the middle of Paul teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the operations of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of this chapter is to bring balance to the teaching that the Lord gave to Paul that are contained in chapters 12 and 14 about the gifts of the Spirit. If we emphasize the gifts and do not teach believers how to allow their giftings to operate from a heart of love, then the work that we accomplish will be unfruitful. And so will we. In addition to the Lord instructing Paul to teach on the importance of love to bring balance to believers who seek to operate in spiritual gifts, the Lord also wanted us to realize that it's about relationship, not function alone. I'm somebody because I have the ability to do such and such. And we get our identity from what we do, not who we are. And so the Lord has had to expose all of that because through it, flesh of man got lifted up. Pride came into the body of Christ. It was about personality, not about being personable. We aren't called to go through the motions of ministry. You're not called to just go through the motions. You can go through the motions in a marriage. Your wife or your husband can talk to you and you just tune it out. Getting quiet in here. That probably happened today, so why you're all quiet. Are you not listening to me? No, I'm not listening to you. (laughs) Because we have a way of going through the motions in our life. We do it at work. We're so used to doing what we do, we just do it without even really thinking about it, if we're not careful. 
And the Bible says when you do that, you're on dangerous ground because people will perceive the difference between a heart of love and a heart that is operating just on function. If we operate through just going through the motions, it is because our heart isn't right. It's not operating through love. For God so loved the world that he gave not a prophet with tablets of stone, but he gave to the world his only begotten son who was filled with grace and truth for the remission of our sins and to bring balance into the body. We must maintain a right relationship with the Father so that we are able to maintain a balanced life in the Spirit. We have to have a right relationship. Before you can have a consistent life of peace and balance, you must first learn how to have a life of order. The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. It's not for us to figure out, it's for us to hear. He orders our steps, not us. This means that we have to stay in constant fellowship with the Father through prayer so that we can remain balanced or otherwise we will, on our best day, be off balance. And mind you, in 20 years of pastoring the church, it's easy to get off balance because people come to the pastor and tell them what they think God is saying and what we need to do as a body. And pastors who have the fear of man will listen to that and open up the body to something that's not of God but is of somebody's desire. And they birth Ishmael's in the body of Christ. And God says, because you birthed this Ishmael in the body of Christ in this house, I've got to come in there. I've got to expose it. You've got to repent, get your heart right because you listen to a person. You listen to the pressure of man to do what they wanted to do instead of I told you to do. Now you've got all the sheep confused because they're not hearing from me. They're hearing from that person that wanted you to do this and you gave into that. So now I've got to straighten all this mess out, expose it for what it is, and then introduce what I was wanting you to do that you didn't do to start with. And it took 20 years to learn that lesson. John chapter 8, verse 4. You know the story. This woman's caught in the act of adultery. And if you don't know it, you can read John chapter 8. But let's pick it up, verse 4. Then the men who brought the woman to Jesus said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the what? In the law commanded us that such... Be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, here's what Jesus said. You've already heard what the law said through Moses. Stone such a woman. And this is what Jesus told her. And Jesus represents what? Grace and truth. Neither do I condemn you, but he says, go and sin no more. That's what grace and truth does. It's not just grace. It's grace and truth. You can't have either or, or you're off balance. Grace and truth. I don't condemn you. Don't do it again. Or I will whoop your britches up one side down the other, and you'll wish you'd never seen a man. This is a great New Testament example of the law of God meeting face to face with the truth and grace of God. That's why I love this story so much, what it represents. Just because God allowed a transition to take place where the law was fulfilled through Jesus and he introduced, the Father introduced, a new covenant that is based on grace, it does not mean that we can live any way we choose. We can't allow ourselves to cast off all restraints. 
just because we're under grace and not under the law. Because we know under the law, you get caught, you die. We're not up under that. So people think, well, since we're not under that, we'll just cast off all restraint and we'll live this way. And there has to a degree, a large degree in the body of Christ, especially in the last 15 years, been an abuse of God's grace in the teachings, especially in the teaching arena of grace and how it is allowing people to cast off all restraint. Because God loves you. Jesus loves you. You're under grace. You're not under the law. And so there has been that element of people in the body of Christ that have thrown off restraint. If people that are taught the law weren't balanced in it when they were taught it, when they are taught truth and grace, they won't be balanced in that either. If you're not balanced when you're taught one thing, you won't be balanced when you find out something new. Because the problem isn't with the law. The law is good and holy. The problem isn't grace and truth. That is holy. The problem is us, how we perceive the law and how we perceive truth and grace. People have a tendency to go from you can't do anything to you can do as your heart leads you to do. Do you see the polar opposites? Under law, you can't do anything. Under grace, you do whatever you want to. Whatever you feel, whatever your heart is leading you to do, that's what you do. People who do not know how the Christian faith is supposed to operate correctly, they will swing like a pendulum on a clock from one side of the spiritual road to the other. I call that ditch ministry. The blind lead the blind. They all end up in the... God didn't call us to ditch ministry. He called us to find balance in it. And he leaves it up to us, y'all. You've got to find the balance. You've got to seek him with your whole heart and call upon him while he is near so that when you call out on him and say, Lord, I'm not feeling this balance thing. I need that in my life. Show me balance in this area of my life. I just don't feel right about it. And God will start showing you balance. He'll start bringing scripture to your heart. And when you read it, he'll bring it out to you and say, this is why you're not feeling balanced. You're not applying this scripture to your life. You're off balance. Get a washing machine off balance. It'll dance all over the laundry room. Get your car, the flywheel, off balance. It'll shake the motor out of the car. When things get off balance, it creates destructive things. After the men who presented themselves as agents of God's law in the story tried to use the law to entrap Jesus, Jesus showed them the error of their own ways. He let the men know that they weren't living out or applying the law of God correctly to their own lives. Jesus showed them that. He says, you act like, I'm paraphrasing, you're carrying out the law of God and applying it correctly, but you're erring in the way that you're doing it because you're picking and choosing who you can condemn and who you will let go. You're letting the woman go and yet you know where she's going to be and what time she's going to be there, and you know what she's going to be doing. How do you know all of that except you've been with her, maybe? And you let the man go? Where's he? See, they were picking and choosing. Isn't it interesting that preachers that preach the law and preach clothesline doctrine, that they'll put the people under their thumb, but they themselves won't keep, and when somebody finds favor with them, they won't hold their feet to the fire either. Because it's done by man through flesh and not through the Spirit of God with balance. So they were using God's law to condemn others while they themselves could do as they wanted. They were treating themselves not as agents of the law to carry out the law. They were using the law as if they were the giver of the law. Look at the balance that Jesus, who, by the way, is the Son of God, who operated from the position of sonship, and not an agent on assignment from God of the law. Look at the balance that Jesus brought to this situation. The law that the men refused to keep didn't seem to impact their hearts at all. Do you think about that? Do you know how deviant these men were? They were manipulating and using the law both against that woman, but more importantly, against Jesus. 
They used the law to tempt him that they might find something of fault that they could use against him. That's deviant behavior. Their hearts were not right. And it doesn't show up until Jesus says, He that is among you without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. Instead of the law convicting the men of their own sins, they were prideful and self-righteous, meaning full of themselves, because they found fault with Jesus. Perhaps in part because they knew that he dined with and spent time with the sinners and tax collectors. That really bothered them. Why is it that your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat? Why is it that y'all worry about washing the outside of the vessel, but the inside is dead man's bones? Vipers? It bothered them. Why does your teacher hang out with tax collectors and publicans? Because he associated. You can associate with people without being attached to them. See, we've got to understand this revelation. You can associate with sinners. You can associate with things, but you cannot attach yourself to those people. I'll get in your boat, but I won't do what you're doing. Because if I get in your boat, I get in your life, I'm going to let the light of God shine through me and show you the error of your ways. I'm not going to do it. The light of God in me is going to do it through me because the love of God is in my heart and it's going to shine out. And when the love of God shines out and the light of God is shining out, you don't have to preach to people. Your lifestyle will preach to people. They'll be so convicted, they'll get up and walk out of the room. When you walk in, when you try to talk to them, they'll turn a deaf ear to you and walk away from you. That's the body of Christ, y'all. That's what we've got to get back. Now I've done it, gone ahead and started preaching, but I might as well preach because that's exactly where the body of Christ has got to get. When our light is so bright, it causes them, the darkness in them, to start screaming out and say, have you come to torment me before my time? At religious, demon knows when you're religious. He knows when you got love. Jesus exposed their hypocrisy with his grace and truth while at the same time, y'all, freed the woman from death. That's what balance does. They made a mess. Those men made a religious mess because they had deviant hearts. And Jesus cleaned every bit of that up with that one statement. He that is among you without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. He nipped it all in the bud. He convicted them of their sin, and he exonerated her of hers. They didn't change. She did. It convicted them of their sin, but it exonerated her of her sin. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's what grace and truth does. It brings balance back in to the body of Christ. And we're trying to get all this stuff straightened out. And we make a bigger mess out of it if we just leave it alone and say, God, this is a mess. What do you want me to do about it? All flesh will do is produce more flesh. Genesis 2. This came as a root out of Genesis. Imagine that. Genesis 2.15. Are you there? Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Drop down to verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept and he took out one of his ribs, closed it up in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Notice that Eve didn't even exist when God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden. She wasn't in existence when God warned him of the tree of knowledge of good and evil not to eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Nowhere 
in the discourse between God and Adam, does the Lord God tell Adam not to touch of the tree of knowledge? Nowhere. Look at Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more cunning, more crafty, more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Where did she get that phrase? Nor shall you touch it. Why was the phrase, do not touch, added to what God said? Now, we could suspect that all day long. Unless it's revealed to us, it'd just be another opinion. If this phrase was added by Adam and or Eve, did that phrase keep them from touching the tree? No. So anything we add to God's Word to get somebody to do what we want them to do is not going to keep them from doing what we don't want them to do. Did it work for Adam? Woman, don't you even touch that. My siblings, all six of them, and I were raised under the Eve doctrine. I'm not saying mom and daddy did it, but we were raised under the Eve doctrine. We couldn't do hardly anything because most everything was of the world. Anybody else raised under that doctrine? It couldn't go anywhere Because that's where sinners go and sin. I didn't know what a roller rink was. Bowling alley, what's that? God forbid you even mention the (laughs) drive-in. Here's where we could go. We could go to the grocery store. We live for Saturday morning. Cartoons in the grocery store. It's the only time I remember getting out until I was 38. (laughs) And we could eat. Thank God for food. It was the highlight of our day. Now, it wasn't quite that strict, but it was close and you get the picture. I use the example of Eve and the phrase, do not touch it, to highlight how we can get off balance in our faith walk. They added, do not touch. We want to make sure that those we are responsible for will do what we tell them. Unfortunately, We have allowed the spirit of fear to creep into our faith walk so that we add it into our commitment to live for God in the world. In other words, we scare people through fear into obeying what God said, and it's wrong. Now, you go out there and you do that, you play that, you're going to fall and break your neck. Fear. Don't do that. That's all you got to do. Don't do that. And then when they do it, whoop them. Word from mom and daddy. And they didn't have repeat offenders. <laughs> Buddy, when daddy whooped you, you know you've been whooped. They wouldn't no more. Hey, then let's go do it again. That didn't hardly stick. I don't know who taught parents about hickories. They go out there and get those hickories about 12 feet long. And I always strip the leaves off of them. Now, those leaves were given to hickories for buffering our flesh from the stems that are underneath those leaves. Can I get a witness? And they go and strip those off. And you look at that thing, that skinny whip, and it goes, So we institute fear to try to scare people into being obedient to us. That's wrong. Fear has been a very big tactic in the 20th century. Last century, it was used a lot to hold people's feet to the fire. Now, here's the problem. Being prideful and fearful are the results that come from those who do not correctly apply the law of God to their hearts and lives. It will either produce its polar opposites. It will either produce pride to those who are giving out the law and fear to those who are under the law. The difference that I see between the Jews who were given the law in the Old Covenant and David is this. The Jews tried to keep God's law. David loved God's law. That was the difference. David wrote in his psalm, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It didn't say, 
I have hidden your word in my heart so I might not sin against your law. That's what we would be concerned about. Well, I don't speed because I'm going to break the law. No, you don't speed because you don't want to break God's heart. To David, listen, this is the difference. The law was given through a prophet with tablets. Operation. The truth and grace are given through the Son, relationship. To David, it wasn't about breaking the law of God, but to him it was about not breaking the heart of God. Relationship. Saul was not about that. Saul was not about relationship. He was about function. He was about fear of man. Right? I didn't obey you, God, because I feared the people. So whenever you don't fear God and you don't love God, then you are apt to sin against your purpose. David did not sin against his purpose. He sinned against God's law. There's a big difference. If you sin against God's purpose, God has no purpose for you. Hence the reason why he removed Saul and had him killed. David goes and commits a sin and commits murder, which seems is worse. Probably the worst thing you can do to a person is extinguish their life. And yet God restores David's throne and does not also restore him to his throne. He restores the throne for eternity. Why? Because David sinned against the law. He did not sin against the purpose. And when you don't fear God and you don't love God, you're more apt to sin against the purpose of God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. Is this helping you? John writes, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. We believe it. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected. So there is a process, just like with faith, that we have to go through where love is perfected in us. And love has been perfected among us in this that we may have. Here it comes, y'all. We're living in the last days. We're living in the evil days that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, are we not? Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about it. Thessalonians, we're living there, aren't we? That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Wow. I don't know about you, but when I go before a judge... I don't exactly have boldness. How would you like to go before God as your judge and have boldness in his presence? God wants us perfected in love so that in the day of judgment, we're not running like roaches when light comes on. We are standing still and we're bold in God's presence. There is no fear in love. There's no need to run. I've been made perfected in God's love. He is the one that justified me. He is the one that is my adequacy. He is the one who perfects me. He is the one that completes me. He is the one that covers me. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Have you ever tried to assemble something that you have purchased and you were so anxious to get it together that you ignored the instructions, man? <laughs> I don't need those. Throw them away. Well, what's all these extra parts? <laughs> when God sent Jesus to fulfill the law and then give New Testament believers his truth and grace, God did more than give us a new covenant. That's just part of it. With the new covenant and with grace and truth to replace the law, the Father has also, here it comes, given us his spirit that we might be called the children of God. There's no reason to fear a God who gives you his spirit and calls you his child. We're children of God not illegitimate. Therefore, because we are children of God, we have His Spirit in us, that means He's accepted us. Since we've been given the Holy Spirit or the nature of God, we are more than God's servants. We are also God's children. Therefore, not only are we not under the law, but we are no longer, here it comes, under the spirit of bondage again to fear. We're not under that. 
By God giving us his spirit, he's taken that other spirit out of us and delivered us from the spirit of bondage again to fear. There's no fear here. I trust God. I love God because God first loved me. Fear is produced in believers' hearts when they are taught and are focused on primarily on the do's and don'ts of God. Don't touch it. And leave off teaching on the Spirit of God. If we do not keep relationship in the center of our faith walk, because relationship is what keeps it balanced, it would be the equivalent of not having an equilibrium to maintain balance, even though we have two legs and feet to keep us balanced as we walk. We have to keep relationship in the center of it to balance grace and truth. Don't the Bible say it's a three-strand cord that isn't easily broken? Grace, truth, and the Holy Spirit. He will show us how to correctly apply grace and truth to our lives. Work out your own salvation. He will show us how to correctly apply grace and truth to our ability to judge correctly. And he will show us how to correctly apply grace and truth to our commitment to the Father apart from fear and pride. How would you like to escape fear and pride? There are two pits that believers can fall in when they're not walking in balance. Without a healthy communion with the Father through the Spirit, people will do exactly as they are currently doing in the church world. They will cast off all restraint. They've been taught sloppy grace. Many children who were raised under the law of do not touch and fear, when they became adults, and there's statistics to bear this out, when they became adults, many didn't know how to do marriage. And they didn't know how to raise children that were balanced or how to walk in the spirit with balance. It's very destructive to not be balanced in our faith walk. This is sobering, y'all. This is why we've got to have balance in the body of Christ and in church fellowships. There needs to be balance. The pastor, the leader of the church, had better have a very close and intimate relationship and listen to the direction of the Father so that he could keep them balanced. There is safety in the number of counsel. Because if you don't, Fear and pride will destroy marriages and families. And we're living with the results of that right now. Well, we just came out from under the law. God saved us. Now children won't listen to the parents at all. You try to correct them. They ignore you. You tell them to do something. They walk away from you. Well, when I was a kid, I'd pick myself up if I did that. We lost the fear because God says it's got to be done out of love. There's where we're at. We've got to teach people what God's kind of love is. You ready for it? There will be a test. 2 Corinthians 5. Here's the balance. I was talking to somebody. I had a friend and the friend was warning their children of something, inundating them with emails and stories and stuff, warning them, don't do this. And parents who aren't taught what I'm about to say destroy their own relationship with their adult children. And here's why. When we were raising our three sons, and they became of age to do what they wanted to do. We tried to, for lack of a better term, control them because when they were young, we wanted to protect them. Everything had to be perfect. Everything had to be righteous. Everything had to be godly. And we did that to protect them. We wanted them to be perfect children. And so you protect them. When you raise that child up and they come to the age of accountability and you're still trying to protect them, that protection goes from protection to control. 
And if you don't make that transition, that you're not dealing with little children any longer, you're dealing with adults. And you try to make them do things that you think will protect them when they don't feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to do it. Then they will see that as control. And here's the problem. When they read, listen to what the Spirit is saying because there are families that are suffering because of this. Ignorance will destroy families. They try to control and manipulate people, their children, their grown children through this. And so whenever you do that, what you're doing is you're not respecting them as an adult. You're not letting them and releasing them to be adults. And they pick up on not what you're telling them to do. They pick up on, and this is what I hear, I don't respect you. And they will start resenting you for not respecting them. And then it escalates because when they build up resentment against you, they oppose you and draw back from you, and you feel that drawback, and you will feel the need to want to push the wall. And that will escalate until eventually the relationship will be breached and they'll leave you. And so, what you have to do is you've got to change your methodology. They're adult children. You speak wisdom into their life and you respect them as adults. And if they choose to make their mistake, all the do not touch laws you can throw at them will not keep them because your do not touch laws will push them into it. And then they will blame you for why they are in jail. So what you do is say, you know what? That's what we had to do. If that's what you want to do, that's between you and God. It's on you. They end up in trouble. They knew what happened. Mom and dad didn't drive them there. They drove themselves. And so you have to release them. And releasing them. Jesus himself had this issue with Mary. And he's Jesus. He's in there teaching. The house is full. Mary's outside. And Mary says, I'm his mother. Tell him I want him. And Jesus says, who is my mother? Who are my sisters my brothers? Those who do the will of the Father. These are my sisters, my mother, and my brothers. And no longer after that clash... Do you see Mary interjecting herself into his ministry? It's a natural occurrence. Why didn't some preacher get up and tell you all this a long time ago? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the law of Christ. That's not what it says, is it? For the wrath of Christ. For the love of Christ compels or constraineth, King James says. Compels or constrains us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh even though we have known Christ according to the flesh yet now we know him thus no longer when that which is perfect has come that which is done in part will be done away with therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation old things have passed away and behold all things have become new now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself he did it we didn't do it it wasn't our works he did it he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We have to allow the love of God to be the motive that compels, constrains us to do what we do and to serve the Lord and others. That has to be our main reason why we do things out of love. Anything else will not produce the correct results and it could end up disastrous. Constrained there means to hold together. His love holds us together. It constrains us. His love does that. It's the bond. It's the cohesiveness. It is the adhesive that holds us together with grace and truth. There's a bond there. It's called love. It also means to compel, to hold, but here's the one I like, to arrest. The love of God arrests us. Has the Lord ever told you to do something and it was like you were under arrest by the Holy Spirit until you did it? 
You couldn't think anything else. You couldn't do anything. You knew you had to do it. That's what the love of God does. Because somebody doesn't have the love of God for God, when the Holy Spirit arrests them, they will resent it and say no. That's why the love has to come into the body of Christ, because it will constrain people. We don't have to go out and arrest them. The love of God will bring them in. That's what had to get a hold of the prodigal son out there when he had attached himself to a person that worked him like a dog for nothing. Let your children find out that kind of life. They'll find out how good they had it at mom and daddy's. The love's got to come back. And let somebody, somebody that has been loved all their life, let them walk away from that love. And eventually, that stuff out in the world, the pleasures, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, all of that will eventually fade away and they will be devoid of the love and says, it's the love that I am missing. And that is what this generation is about to have a wake-up call. And they're going to realize there is nothing in those corn husks. There is nothing in that far country. There is nothing in the citizens in that far country. I had it better in the Father's house. And the love of God is going to draw them back in the church. Come on, give God some praise in this house. You can resist anything, but you cannot resist love. Or there's no hope for you. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with, with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Here it is. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? How can two walk together except they're agreed? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them. I'll walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, since he has said this, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. And here it is. Yes, it's in Scripture. Do not touch. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So I looked up touch there. It says, see Eve. <laughs> touch literally means to attach oneself. Touch not. Don't attach yourself to the unclean. It's deeper than don't touch. We're in the world. Paul says, where are you going to go that you ain't going to be around sinners? I paraphrase that scripture. But that's literally what he meant. It's where you latch on to someone or something that God has convicted you by his Holy Spirit not to be in communion with and you attach yourself to it or them anyway. The Lord is requiring us. This is the word of the Lord for the hour. God gave it to me down there in Augusta. He says, tie 2 Chronicles 7, 14 with this scripture here in 2 Corinthians 6. That is exactly what God is calling this body of Christ to. He's telling us to humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from our evil ways. He will hear from heaven, forgive our sin. He will heal our land. But he says here, come out from among them, touch not what is unclean, and I will receive you. That means I will take responsibility for you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, not just my people. I'm going to make you my sons and daughters because I'm going to be responsible for you, and you will be accountable to him, says the Lord Almighty. That is exactly what God is saying to the body of Christ. Come out from among them. Don't touch what is unclean. Don't be associated. Don't be connected to. Don't be attached to that which is unclean. That which God has told you in his word or by his spirit is unclean. Get away from it. Get as far away from it because that is exactly what is bringing judgment on America and on the house of God because people are not living holy in the body of Christ and you will through the flesh bring judgment upon yourself. It has nothing to do with God. It is us doing it and we've got to take responsibility for it. Come out from among them. We're in it, but we're not of it. 